What's up, Trek Nation, and welcome back to After the Snap. It's me, Tasha Pierce, and I am here today to talk with you about Star Trek Strange New Worlds Season 2, Episode 2, Ad Astra Per Aspera. This one is written by Dana Horgan and directed by Valerie Weiss with a star date of 2393.8. In it, Commander Una faces court martial alongside with possible imprisonment and dishonorable dismissal from Starfleet, and her defense is in the hands of a lawyer who's also a childhood friend with whom she had a terrible falling out. That attorney is played by Yatiti Badaki, brilliantly, might I add, and she's like a former friend of Una Chin Riley, and we learn a lot about Illyrian society in this episode. We find that there are two types of Illyrians, those who can pass as human and those who can't or won't pass. So Nira falls into this latter category. She was very human presenting. So I have to assume that the reason why she couldn't pass is because she had the type of an immune system that would glow when activated and her family chose not to hide this fact. This led to the very vicious persecution of her cousin, Ivan Katul, uh, 10 years old, and his parents as they were arrested once they were found out to be genetically modified. So this has left Nira with some strong feelings about the Federation, and I'm not talking about the warm and fuzzy kind. Now, Una's family chose to hide their modifications and blend in with human society. So she moved on with her life, joining Starfleet, and rising through the ranks quickly until she was on the wrong end of the Federation's ban on mods, which we learn is a slur that people use when they were talking about Illyrian. And we find out that Starfleet and East Federation citizens treated the Illyrians pretty darn badly. They were on their worst behavior as it pertains to this colony. And it made me wonder, what if U.S. history kind of behaved in the same model as the Federation? I think that warrants us to examine it just a little bit further. So let's take a trip to a strange new sidebar. If Earth's eugenics war occurred sometimes in the 1990s to the early aughts, the events of Strange New Worlds would be over 200 years in its future. Let's take a look at some of the laws that have been amended in the United States in 200 years. Just the bit. Number one, the Bill of Rights. You know, free speech and guns and all that stuff. Number two, the 13th Amendment which freed my forefathers and mothers from the wicked institution of slavery. Number three, Dred Scott versus Sanford. If you're unsure, look it up. I'm a Trekkie, not a history teacher. Number four, prohibition repeal, setting precedent for one amendment written to repeal an earlier one. Number five, women could vote unless you were black. That would come much later. Number six, the 26th Amendment gave young men the right to vote for the person in the office who could potentially send them off to die for the country. Number seven, a small one, civil rights. And number eight, an even smaller one, gay marriage. Imagine how different the U.S. would look without those laws and amendments that protect citizens and afford rights that weren't originally spelled out by our Constitution. Now ask yourself, why the forward-thinking Federation of Planets would still have a law on its books that judges a group of people by less than the content of their characters. Yet we know that parts of this archaic by their standards train of thought remains in the late 24th century. Of course, events from this episode do set a precedent on how the question of eugenics will be handled with emphasis placed on the genetically modified individual rather than the modifications themselves. It also might provide some explanation as to why the many violations of the Prime Directive by Starfleet captains are forgiven in future iterations of Trek by examining then-Captain April's judgment calls during his time on the Enterprise. This was an episode filled with allegories. There were allegories to the treatment of indigenous people, the civil rights movement, the current fight for the rights of queer folks to be out and proud, uh, the Holocaust, among others. Ooh, I thought I saw touches of uh, the struggle for women to get gynecological services that was pre-Roe versus Wade and post-Roe versus Wade, and the lack of medical empathy 
for victims of the early AIDS epidemic when it was considered to be a gay disease. Uh, there's so much addressed, yet, in my opinion, it doesn't feel hammy or, or, or heavy handed. Now, from a layperson's point of view, I am no expert, but I did think the courtroom scenes were TV believable and mostly consistent with what we've seen in prior instances of Star Trek. Uh, I like the emphasis that was placed on the little glowy hand scanner slash lie detector that each witness placed their hands on. It also influences us into believing that they are telling the truth in their testimony. And it's a callback also to what we saw in TOS. One thing I'm not particularly sure I liked is the spread out nature of this courtroom. There are reasons for that. But before you start to get into the reasons, I am used to a courtroom being a more intimate environment where people are not shouting across the room to the judges. That was one of the things that I guess can be considered a nitpick, but that kind of took me out of the scene. Now, one of my favorite scenes was Admiral April's testimony and Nira's presumed attack on him, how that set up a wonderful exchange about Starfleet becoming its better self. Now, while she may have meant it to be uh, an attack on the Federation's hypocrisies on the first day of court, Nira tied it up very neatly into her argument that Starfleet allows its captains to make judgment calls and that Pike's uh, concealment of Una's status was another example of that. It also showed why Pike risked life and limb to go to an in inhospitable planet to find Nira. She truly was the best attorney for the job. A Federation trained defense attorney would have looked at the entire situation through a Federation lens. Now, this is evidenced by the public defender that was initially provided to Una, who just advised her to simply plead guilty so this whole situation could just go away. In order to truly examine Starfleet and its fear of all augmented people based on the actions of just a few, an outsider had to be the one holding up the mirror. So let's talk for a moment about the uh, Vulcan Admiral, Admiral Pasalk. He was like the metaphor for, for people who want to apply the law without empathy for the people that laws are meant to protect. So he viewed Una's case as an opportunity to literally bludgeon her career and Pike's without any empathy or any thought about what those individuals brought to Starfleet. The animosity he has with Spock which was hilariously demonstrated in the early moments of this episode is quite understandable. Uh, that scene from early in the episode also showed or Ortega's stereotyping all Vulcans and being taken to school by Mbanga, who is a jack of all trades, we're learning, uh, one of which is being a student of Vulcan body language and behavior. And you can join me on this special Monday at 4.30 p.m. Uh, Central Time on Engage Live, our weekly Star Trek live stream to discuss the other things we saw in Ad Astra per Aspera, like the dress uniforms and the eerie feeling that we've been in that courtroom before. Today, I just wanted to talk about the story and what it means in the world that I'm occupying right now. Uh, this episode is doing what Trek has always done. It's holding a mirror up to society and asking us if we like what we see. Now, there are many many who are going to feel personally attacked by the messages that this entry sends. And that's okay. This is what Star Trek has always done. And also, Martin Luther King once said, we will have to repent in this generation, not only for the evil words and deeds of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Now, I don't want to label people as good and bad here, but if you're actively engaging in an effort to erase other people's stories, you've kind of labeled yourself. Uh, we hope that in just a few years, this episode will be a cautionary tale about where we came from and how we don't wish to revisit this dark point in history. Kind of like the TOS episode, Let That Be Your Last Battlefield. We look at that episode today and realize how ridiculous it seems that these people would be involved in a forever war based on something as simple as the color of their skin, forgetting that during that period in history, the U.S. was involved in that very thing. 
So today's hot button issues are trans rights and women's reproductive rights. And I can't wait until we can say that this is just another ugly footnote in our history. Until then, Trek gon' Trek. Trek is gon' Trek, y'all. And speaking of Trek, this really and truly felt like it was pulled straight out of TOS. Everybody's not going to agree, and that's what makes the world go round when it's not about something uh, monumental, when it's something that we can agree to disagree on. I feel like this episode was true to the heart of what TOS stood for, and I was completely here for it. So it should come as no surprise to you when I tell you that my right that my rating for this one is a five. If I could give it more, I would, but my rating scale is from one to five. So five is as good as it can get. I hope to find out in the comments below what you thought of this episode, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you rated. I rarely ask what you guys would rate it. Tell me what you would rate this episode. Also, while you're down there, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, turn your notifications on so you'll be reminded when Engage Live on Monday this week. It's usually on Sundays, but join me here Monday this week. Also, these are some people who love me. They support my show. So I'm going to show their names right here. With all that being said, I've got nothing else. Thank you for joining me here today, and I will see you in the next one. Live long and prosper. Peace.